Okay, so let's go back to the properties of a hash function. Uh, we got sidetracked a little bit here. Um, so what we were talking about is pre-image resistance, uh, which you can think of as an, a, a nicer way of saying it is the hash function is one way. So you can, if you have an input, you can calculate the output. If you have an output, you can't go backwards. Uh, we could even draw that out. So if you have a hash function, uh, you have an input, you can compute the output. Uh, but if you want to go back uh, in the other direction, uh, there's no way uh, that you can do that. That's more feasible than just trying every input until you happen to get the output that you want. Okay. The other little caveat that's not too important, um, but because you're mapping hash functions, which can be any size, arbitrary length, um, it is the case that there will be more than one input that will produce the same output. There just mathematically has to be because your output size is smaller than your input size. Uh, so when this happens, we have what we call collisions, and collisions are going to be really important. Uh, we'll, we'll come to them in one very quick second. But I'll note that this pre-image resistance property, uh, in order to break it, you just have to find any x. Okay, So you don't have to find, quote unquote, the right x, Okay, because you don't even know what the right x is necessarily. Uh, that depends a lot on the context of where this hash function is used. So, uh, as long as you, it should be infeasible to find any x uh, that gives you that particular y. Okay, and uh, the amount of time uh, that this takes, just for your own interest, um, so for a SHA 256 without a significant break. So we haven't had any significant breaks, uh, but by the time you watch this lecture, there might be. Um, so, so, so for SHA-256, as of right now, uh, without a significant break, uh, this takes 2 to the 256. That's infeasible. That's a lot bigger than 2 to the 112, uh, which is what NIST is looking for. You might wonder, well, why is it, why is it so much bigger than it needs to be? Uh, that's because there's some other properties of the hash function that we want uh, that are going to um, that are going to be a little there's going to be a shortcut uh, so we have to make this number a little bit bigger okay so let's uh, turn to this idea of collisions um, so the second property we want formally is called collision resistance And there's two types of, of uh, collision resistance. There's a strong variant and a weak uh, variant of it. Uh, before I get there, let's, let's talk about what a, res a collision is. So let's say you have an x, and you have a different value of x. We'll call this x prime, such that x uh, and x prime are not the same. And let's say that, that for these particular two values, uh, when you put them through your hash function, uh, they produce the same y. Okay, there's one y that comes out the other end. Okay, that's what we call a collision. Okay, so two x's uh, that, that produce essentially the same y. Okay, and with a hash function, the, the easy way of understanding it is that it should be really hard to find these collisions. Okay, in fact, it should be infeasible, right? You should not be able to find any two messages uh, that will collide. Um, and then this is going to let us build some, some interesting security properties. So you'll, you'll see the motivation for these. Now, there's two cases where you might want a collision when, it's, when you're attacking a system that uses a hash function. And um, the most common case is that somebody else hashes some data. So they come along, they have their data, which is X, and they produce a hash of it, which is Y. And maybe you know what the data is, maybe you don't. And what you're going to do is you're going to find a second piece of data that produces that same hash. Okay. So in other words, um, one set of inputs, the one X and the output Y have already been chosen. And all you're doing is trying to find a second, uh, a second message that's going to collide. Okay. That turns out to be a really hard problem. Now there's a variant of the attack where what you do is you get to choose both X's. So you can choose two messages um, and you get to choose both of them and the only property is that they, that they want to come out with the same y okay so 
In the one attack, uh, one x is chosen for you. In the other attack, you get to choose both the pair of values that produce this extra y. And so it turns out that that extra degree of freedom of being able to choose two x's, uh, it lends you uh, a whole, it makes it, it, it's a lot more efficient to attack, okay? It's so efficient that in that the first case uh, will be two to the 256, and the second case will end up being um, the square root of two to the 256, uh, which works out to be two to the uh, 128. And we'll, let's circle back to, to those small details and, and get some of this written down, okay? So collision resistance, we have two uh, variants of collision resistance. Uh, so I'll start with the, the sort of easier property to break. Uh, so we call it weak. We call it a weak security property because it's easier to break. Uh, so this is called weak collision resistance. And uh, if you read the crypto literature, uh, there's, there's another name for this uh, that's often used, which is uh, second pre-image resistance. Uh, I like weak collision resistance better because it's, it's actually mathematically closer related to collisions than it is to finding pre-images. Uh, so in a weak collision resistance uh, function, uh, basically what you're doing is, uh, we'll assume the most liberal case, so we'll assume that you're given an input x. Let's call it an input and output y. Or if you don't have the output, you can compute it yourself because the hash function is a public function. And uh, what you want to do is, well, what we want the property to say is that it's impossible to, or infeasible to rather, uh, it's infeasible um, to find a different x not equal to the original x um, such that the hash of both of them are, are the same value. Okay, so the hash of x or the hash of x prime or y, the output of the hash function, those, those are all the same value. Okay, so this is, is the definition of a collision. And then there's a stronger variant of collision resistance, which is usually just called collision resistance. Uh, it's stronger in the sense that it's harder to achieve. So you might write um, um, sorry, sorry, let me correct myself. So uh, a weak collision resistance is actually harder to achieve. okay? Uh, achieving collision resistance is harder for the designer of the cryptographic algorithm or the hash function to achieve. Um, so a weak hash function, might have weak collision resistance, but it might not have collision resistance. Okay, so this always confuses me because we can apply to either the attacker or the designer of the algorithm, so it's, it's a little bit confusing. So let me say that again. Um, a hash function may have weak collision resistance. It's an easier property to achieve as the designer of a hash function, but it might not have collision resistance. So case in point, uh, if you remember, uh, last, in the last section, we talked about a bunch of different hash algorithms. Um, so MD5 and SHA-1, they do not have uh, collision resistance. So the reason we put an X beside them and said they're insecure is uh, you can find collisions, okay? Uh, however, as far as we know, they do have weak collision resistance. So no one has, has found an attack and they still have pre-image resistance as well for, for what it's worth. Um, okay, so collision resistance uh, is just a twist where you're allowed to do two things. So we give the attacker a little more freedom uh, so what we do is we allow them to choose two x's. Um, so they're not given anything, actually. They can, they can choose these values uh, for themselves. Um, so we say it's infeasible to choose two values, x and x prime, such that x is not the same as x prime, and uh, the hash of x equals the hash of x prime. And y, we can call the output of that y, if you want to add equals y. Um, so in this case, you have more freedom because you can choose both of these values. Uh, in the weak case, uh, one is given to you and one uh, you have to choose, okay? Um, so how feasible are these? Well, in this case, uh, the best algorithm should be if the, the hash function is secure. Uh, the, ha the best algorithm is still a form of exhaustive search. So what are you going to search? 
In this case, you're basically going to give it, be given an x and a y. You're going to choose your x prime. You're going to hash it and say, hey, does that equal the same value? If not, you choose a new x prime, and then you hash it. And you keep doing that until you find one that happens to come out uh, to the right value. And the probability of that happening is 1 over the number of hash outputs, the number of outputs of your hash function. Um, so it's, it's an exhaustive search attack. And it's going to take 2 to the 256 for a 256-bit output uh, for your hash function. OK, so the, these details don't worry so much about. Um, uh, now, collision resistance, it turns out that it's a little easier. When you are allowed to choose both of these values, um, the chances that two values will come out with the same hash uh, tends to be uh, a lot more probabilistic. Like the probability of that happening is, is a lot higher. The fact that you get lucky and you find two of these things that, that come out, um, it's a lot higher than people even think. In fact, there's this famous uh, sort of statistical uh, thing called the birthday paradox. And so this is based on the exact same mathematical principle. Anyways, if you take your crypto course, including my own crypto course, I'll walk you through how the birthday paradox applies to this. Um, it's still a kind of exhaustive search, uh, but, but the birthday paradox gives you a, um, a speed up. So I'll say with this birthday paradox. And at the end of the day, uh, the running time ends up being the square root of 2 to the 256. Okay, And if square roots or exponentials uh, start to confuse you, you don't remember them, uh, remember the square root is the same as raising something to the power of 1 half. Okay, So you have 2 to the 256 all raised to the 1 half. Uh, when you have an exponent to an exponent, you multiply. Uh, so you get 2 to the half of 256, uh, which is 128. And 128 is just above that 112 that NIST wants. Okay, um, So uh, this is still SHA-256, even with this exhaustive search, um, is still secure under NIST's definition, uh, where they want 112 bits of exhaustive search uh, security. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that uh, when hash functions tend to break, it's because there's some attack that's faster than exhaustive search. So you can exploit something about the hash function, the internals of, of how it works, so that you uh, your exhaustive search can be a little bit smarter. You don't have to you know, start with 0, 0, 0, 0 and go 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2. You can shortcut uh, through that space somehow or reduce the space somehow. And so when hash functions tend to break, what we've seen historically is that collision resistance goes first. Uh, then there might be pre-image attacks or weak collision resistant attacks uh, on those algorithms. Um, but collision resistance is, is sort of the first uh, to fall. So we haven't seen any collision attacks or things even getting really close to becoming a full collision attack on SHA-256. Um, so we'll, we'll see how long it, it remains secure. OK, so these are our um, this. Anyways, this, this whole thing may have gotten a little bit theoretical. Uh, so we have this box, it's called a hash function. Uh, we know what the inputs, we know what the outputs are. We know some properties and kind of math speech about uh, what it's supposed to achieve. What's it actually good for? Let's, let's go through some examples and then you'll start to see why pre-image resistance or collision resistance is important. Okay, um, so I'll give you some examples of hash functions. So these things have nothing to do with um, with Bitcoin or blockchain per se, uh, but you have to get really comfortable with this idea of a hash function because Bitcoin and blockchain use uh, use it uh, very extensively. Okay, um, so let's start with I'll give you three or four examples. So we'll do example one. Okay, so let's say that we have two people. Uh, we'll call them Alice and Bob, as we typically do in cryptography. And Alice is holding a file. Say it's a text file, doesn't really matter what it is. Bob is holding a file as well. And Alice and Bob think that they're holding the same file. They think they have exactly the same file, but they're not sure. 
Okay, so the basic question they want to ask is, is it the same file.txt? Okay, so this is sort of the setup of a problem that Alice and Bob might have, and uh, there's going to be a way of solving it uh, that uses a hash function. Okay, so how are we going to, what, what's the relevance of a hash function to this particular example? So the trivial way of, um, of solving this particular problem uh, is what we'll do is, is Alice will just send his, uh, sorry, her file to Bob, uh, and then Bob will check and make sure that it's exactly the same, okay? I'm just going to set up a, a second diagram for the second protocol. So the first protocol we have here is um, Alice sends uh, file.txt to Bob. Uh, we can call it, let's call it file prime because maybe it's the same, maybe it's not. Uh, and then what uh, Bob is going to do is check whether file prime.txt happens to be the same as the file that, that he's holding, okay? Uh, and there's nothing wrong with this protocol. This protocol works fine. Note that we're assuming that the channel itself isn't going to change the file itself, right? So let's say that it turns out that they're not the same file. Well, maybe it's because there was some corruption or an adversary that was on the wire between the two of them. Um, so let's just assume for, for now that the channel itself is, is reliable. Uh, and we're, we can actually use cryptography to provide that channel and we'll, we would use hash functions in order to, to build that channel. But for now, we'll assume that that channel is, is secure. Um, then, then this is, is perfectly fine. So what are we trying to fix? We have this protocol, it's perfectly fine. Uh, why don't we just use it? Well, the only thing that we might want to fix is that file.txt might be really big, right? Maybe it's a movie file or something like that. Um, and it's, it's going to take a long time for Alice to send it to Bob. Okay, so we, what we might do instead is Alice might produce uh, the hash of file.txt. I'll just call this, we'll call it y prime. Uh, Alice can send y prime, which is going to be smaller, maybe, depends how big the file is, but, but generally it's probably going to be smaller. It's going to be 256 bits if they use SHA-256. Okay, to Bob, and then what Bob will do is Bob will take his file .txt, he'll hash it, and he'll ask, when I hash my file, does it end up being the same as, as the hash of Alice's file? Okay, and if they end up being the same, then they can conclude that they say have the same hash. Okay, uh, now, wh what is it from, what is it from the properties of hash function that let us do this particular protocol? So notice that pre-image resistance, this has nothing to do with pre-image resistance, right? Uh, we're assuming in the first protocol that Alice is fine just sending the file across uh, to Bob. Now, maybe th there's a twist on this where maybe Alice and Bob, they want to know whether they have the same file, but they, they're really hesitant to share that file. Like maybe Bob is doesn't actually know that file. Maybe there's some sensitive information. And so uh, Alice wants to kind of compare her file to Bob's, but if it turns out that Bob doesn't have that file, she doesn't want to disclose uh, that file to Bob. So in this case, the fact that you're using a hash function does provide some protection against pre-image resistance. Now, what Bob might do is, if, if the number of possible files is very small, he could just try every file and, until it comes out to the right value. So you have to be a little careful. Um, there, there's better protocols for doing this secure matching uh, that I mentioned, but pre-image resistance might uh, come into play in that case. But the big, the big thing here is this is a collision resistance problem, okay? Uh, in particular, um, what's the probability that it just so happens that a completely different file happens to come out with the same hash as the file that Bob has, right? So if it's hard to even find collisions if you're purposely looking for, uh, the probability of an accidental collision is, is also going to be is going to be very low, okay? Uh, so, uh, and I want to note that even if the file is very, very similar, like say that, you know, one is hello world, and the other file is hello world period, and those two strings are, are really similar. There's only one character that's different. In fact, you might have inputs where only a single bit is different. Like you, you take an input, you flip one bit, the output of the hash should be completely different. Okay, so there's no sort of relationship between the output of the hash and the input of the hash. Uh, so so inputs that, that look very similar will, will cause completely different outputs. It's sometimes called the avalanche effect. Uh, for, for hash functions. 
Um, so anyways, this is a, a sort of more succinct way of doing this. Uh, and this is something that we see in, in the real world. Uh, so for example, if you go and you download, say open source software, even if it's not open source, let's say it's just software, um, then what you might do is you might get a hash of what that file is supposed to look like. And so if somebody was in the middle and they intercepted the fact that you were downloading this file and maybe they want to spy on you so they were gonna add some malware to that file, uh, if, as long as you get that hash and you're confident that that hash value you have is correct, then you can literally download the file from anywhere. It doesn't matter where it's, where it's coming from. Uh, and as long as it produces that same hash, uh, then you're confident that it's the right file and the file wasn't modified in any particular way. Um, so, so another example where we see this, um, um, let, me, let me take that to, to a bit more of an extreme. Um, let's say you're, you're actually pirating software. So let's say instead of paying for software, you want to go to BitTorrent and you want to download um, you know, some file. And this is, this is really problematic uh, if you don't have a way of knowing that the file that you're getting is correct. So uh, what happens in this case? Um, so what will happen is um, you'll have Alice and she'll go to a website like the Pirate Bay or something like that. And she'll download um, She'll say, hey, I want, you know, a bootleg copy of Microsoft Office or Photoshop or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and so the Pirate Bay will have these files. And if someone uploads a copy or if they start distributing a copy of a file that has malware in it, there's nothing, the Pirate Bay is not going to do anything to solve that particular problem. Okay. But let's say that Alice looks at the file and uh, there's a message board and people have voted on the file and lots of people are voting people maybe that she knows that are reputable You know, it's coming from a reputable source and people are saying this file is good. There's no malware in it. Uh, it works um, Then let's assume that that for whatever reason she's very confident uh, That that the file that at least as distributed originally that file was free from malware um, the problem for Alice is when she actually downloads the way BitTorrent works is she doesn't download the file itself from the Pirate Bay Okay, what she downloads is um, the name of the file and she downloads a list of other people uh, that are on this big sort of network. Uh, so this is the BitTorrent network. And there's all these new nodes that are, you know, around the world, computers, she doesn't know any of them. And they're all at least claiming that, hey, we have a copy of this file. And so if you want to download this file, why don't you connect to us, tell us that you want to download it and we'll send it to you. And in particular, what will happen is she'll get kind of little chunks uh, from each person. So one node, you know, will send her the first chunk of the file. Another node will send her the second chunk. Maybe some chunks come from the same nodes because they're fast, whatever the case may be. Okay, and so now we have the second problem, which is let's say that this node here happens to be malicious. Okay, we'll draw a little devil horns uh, to indicate that they're malicious. And so what they might send is instead of sending the real, uh, the real chunk of the file, what they might send is some you know malware version uh, of it. So this is a malicious version. Right? And if it's put into software and you're going to execute it, it's per perfectly possible that this chunk would be enough to, to corrupt the whole thing and, and give uh, arbitrary execution uh, to, the, to the person who, who put it in there. Okay. So what we're going to do to solve this particular problem, so we're not going to solve the problem of, of what was uploaded, but at least if, if what was uploaded, uh, the website is going to validate or they're going to vouch for what we can ensure using a hash function is that uh, when you get these chunks from an untrusted network, uh, so the key here is that uh, the trusted bay, or sorry, the pirate bay here, sorry, is a, is a trusted source, and the network here is untrusted. We don't trust any of these people, okay? Um, but what the pirate bay will give you in the little file that you get, the little torrent file or the magnet link, uh, is uh, there's a more sophisticated data structure, but for simplicity, let's just think of it as a hash of a file. So what will happen is you'll get this hash of the file from the Pirate Bay. Then you'll go and you'll download the file from whoever's giving it to you. And then before you open it, before you actually execute it, uh, once you've completely 
uh, downloaded it, what you'll do is you'll take a hash of it and you'll ask yourself, hey, does this match the hash that I was given um, from, from the, the tracker itself? Okay, and if it doesn't match, uh, then you'll know that something got messed up. Uh, so maybe it was a malicious node, maybe it was just some sort of network error or something like that. But, um, and then you'll have to go and download the file again. Now, what BitTorrent will do to make it a little more efficient is they're not going to take a hash across the whole file. They're going to take you know, hashes of smaller chunks of it so that you, you can figure out uh, if, if some of these chunks got corrupted, which ones they are, so you don't have to re-download the whole thing. Um, but, but anyways, that's, that's how uh, sort of BitTorrent will use this hash property. Okay. Now, what, what is the, what's the property of the hash function uh, that, that we need in order to make this attack or to, to prevent this attack? So we have pre-image resistance and collision resistance. Um, the file itself is not a secret. Eventually, you're going to get the actual file itself. That's the image of the hash function or the input of the hash function. And so since that's not a secret, there's pre-image resistance doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have pre-image resistance or not. Okay. Uh, weak collision resistance is exactly what this malicious node will do. So what they'll do is they'll look at the original copy of the file, which they have no control for. Someone that's chosen for them. Someone uploaded that file. It has a particular hash. And then what they want to compute is a malicious version of that chunk such that the hash happens to come out to the same value. Okay. If they're, if they're able to do that, uh, then what they can do is they can actually insert their malicious chunk. And when uh, the user takes the hash of the file, it will turn out to be the same value because the, the two values collide. Uh, and so because of that collision, uh, Alice will run a file that has a malicious chunk in it. So the fact that you can't find these collisions, that it's infeasible to find these collisions is what secures this protocol. It stops that attack. Okay. Now, what about strong collision resistance or normal collision resistance? So in this case, um, what's going to happen is... Uh, the person, the attacker, they're choosing both. They're choosing two files that tend to produce the same hash. Okay, and so that's not the attack that that we described here. But there is a similar attack that you might do. So, for example, let's say that you were able to find, you know, a good copy of of Office and a bad copy of Office, and they happen to have the same hash, and you chose both of those. Then what you might do is upload the good copy of Office, or, or rather, upload the hash of it, and then when people start downloading it, serve up the good copy of Office. Lots of people will download the good copy. Uh, they'll say it's fine. They'll give it a thumbs up. They'll rate it well. And then after it has a really good rating and everyone thinks that this is a good file, then you can swap it out and you can start distributing the, the corrupt version that has the same hash. Uh, then as a result, people will download the, the corrupt version. They won't know the difference because the hash matches uh, the original. Uh, and, and then you'll get malware infected you know, at least for the, that second set of users that's given the, the malicious uh, software instead. So um, for this particular application, you want strong collision resistance and you want weak collision resistance both uh, in order to, to secure it. That's what you want from your hash function.